growing up in the 80s, I remember there were different movies that I would want to watch. And how many of you remember these? Right? The VHS. This was the way that you would watch a video. This is how you would watch a movie, and no matter what, you always had to be kind, rewind. This is Empire Strikes Back. It's not all the way. It's one of my favorite spots. But, um, you know, it's so funny that this is what we did. And many of our homes, if you grew up in that time, had a wall that decorated all of the movies that you celebrated, that your parents kept in your house. And I know that for me, there were certain movies they didn't have, so I would have to sneak to my friend's house to watch them. Anybody else do this? Liars, you all did. We all did it because certain movies were allowed in our house and not our friend's house, and so we'd make sure we knew. And what's funny is I knew that the movie that we're going to, to check out today was one of the movies that, for some odd reason, never made it into my home. It never made it into my home. It's the movie um, simply called Dead Poets Society. How many of you have seen this? Okay, some of you, like, that hand went up quick. I see that, yeah. You, it was like, I've seen... This movie, uh, I, I don't know why I wanted to see it so bad other than all of my friends were talking about it. All of them had seen it. Now, it came out in 1989, so it's not even like I was that old when it hit VHS because now a movie comes out, you can go see Doctor Strange on Disney Plus already. I guess it didn't do that well. Um, but if you wanted to wait for it to come out on VHS, remember, it was months months that you would wait. And so Dead Poet Society came out. I was all excited. And all I wanted to do was to see this movie because all my friends saw the movie. They were all talking about it. Now, it's kind of ironic that I say that because of the clip that we're about to watch. If you haven't seen this movie, um, let me just set the stage for you. This is a movie that takes place in 1959, and it's it, at this all-exclusive boys' school in Vermont called Welton Academy. This is where super-rich parents send their kids, and they want them to be set up to live the life that they want them to live. The parents have an ideal. They send their kids to get that ideal. This year at Welton Academy, there is a new teacher for English. He's actually an alumni of the academy, and his name is Mr. Keating, and he's played by Robin Williams, who does a killer job in this movie with this role. Mr. Keating was a little bit different, though, than the rest of the teachers because he had a unique approach to his teaching style. He's actually been one who has inspired so many people to go into teaching, and I'm sorry if you took this as inspiration and now you're left disappointed going, that's not what I get to do. I, I am sorry, because I wish it was. He was not about information transferring. He wasn't about making sure the Scantron was filled outright or just memorizing things. He wanted to teach his students how to learn. He wanted them to experience their way into the knowledge of the poetry and the books. So his lessons were very unorthodox. They were quite unappreciated and hated on by the rest of the faculty that was there. But his students got it. His students understood. They were learning. And there comes a point when he wants to teach his students about the 1915 Robert Frost poem called The Road Not Taken. And so he takes them into the courtyard, out of the classroom, and we all love getting out of the classroom, don't we? That was the best time. You're like, oh, we're not going to be in here. Take me anywhere else. So he takes them into the courtyard, and instead of the classroom teaching, this is how he begins this lesson. Now, it's funny because I watch this movie now, and I shake my head, and I think back to why I wanted to watch it. The reason I wanted to see it was because all of my other friends were talking about it. And, and so here I am at almost 10 years old going to watch this movie, and guess how much of it I understood? Almost nothing, almost nothing. But even if I didn't understand it, what I knew at the time was that I wanted to be in step with the people who were around me, right? I wanted to conform. I wanted to walk in the rhythm with everyone else's clap. I'd love to say that this changes for us with age, right? I'd love to say it gets easier, but the truth is it doesn't, does it? It doesn't. It actually gets harder. It gets worse. Some researchers show that uh, people start conforming, and there are a very small group that start conforming at about the age of two. They show minor signs. But by almost 12, most of us have shifted our behaviors to conform to the social norms of the society that we live in, which are different all over the world. 
The only exception to conforming that I could find in all of my research was for individuals with autism who are much less affected by other people. They are who they are and they love it. We could learn a great lesson from these individuals. Whether we would like to admit it or not, we are constantly conforming and finding our stride or rhythm in life. But it is rarely unique and it is largely determined by who's around us and the voices that we're listening to. This is just as true today as it was in the first century when Jesus gathered his disciples, starting by taking a walk on the beach and saying, let's take a walk. Over three years, they began and learned to ask the question all the time that, that we're still asking as his followers today. And that question simply is, am I in step with Jesus or the world? Am I in step, in rhythm, in beat with Jesus, or am I in step, in rhythm, and beat with the world? And before you sit and start applying this to the person next to you and trying to figure out what they are doing, I just want you to pay attention to the pronoun in that question. It is I. Am I in step with Jesus or the world? And here's the deal. You can't be Mr. Dalton, right? You can't lean against a pillar in life and say, I am choosing not to walk. Because the reality is we're all walking. We're all in step. The question is, with who? You know, the Apostle Paul, this very early follower of Jesus, he feels this tension for a church, and he writes a letter to them, and this church is found in the city of Rome. And Paul knew that Rome, this city, was the center of where the entire world's culture came from. And, and this church was just getting their feet underneath them. They're brand new. They're figuring out who they are, and they're under constant pressure to conform to the image of Rome. Here's the problem, though. If they didn't conform, they would stand out. If they did conform, there was a problem. And, and so Paul feels this, and he, and he starts to beg them, and if you turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to the letter to the Romans written by Paul. He says this in chapter 12 to them. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Right up front here, Paul urges. He's not commanding the church here, is he? No, he is pleading with this church because of what the Lord has done. He said, because God has shown you so much mercy, I am begging you, recognize here that your body and your life is no longer yours. It's under the lordship of Jesus. It is God's. And when you treat it like it's God's, this is actually worship. Taking care of our bodies and how we live as people is worship that's pleasing to God. And then in verse 2, he calls them to pay attention to how, how do you then walk in this spiritual journey? And he says this, do not conform. Say that with me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but what's he say? Okay, I know it's hot. Let's, let's just shake it off a little bit. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but instead, what do we need to do? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Paul knows that everybody in this church, just like in ours, are being formed in some way. The question is, to what? Because we're either being conformed into the pattern of this world, or we're being transformed into the image of Christ. There is no leaning against the wall. We're either being conformed to the patterns of this world or transformed by the Holy Spirit into the image of Christ. And I, I just love those two words that Paul uses. It's so beautiful and, and it's got such um, just intention to it. Being conformed or being transformed. And, and I want to look at what those mean because that makes a difference for us when he uses this word conformed. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. And that word in the Greek, conform, it's all about um, like shaping your behavior. 
it's, it's about matching what's happening to the world around you. And it's not really focused on the internal change that we have. It's not concerned with our reason for why we do what we do because in the first century, whether you were um, Roman or uh, Jewish or anybody in this culture, it would be very uh, clearly assumed. If you were doing something, you thought inside that was what you should be doing. Your outward behaviors indicated your inward thoughts, right? That, that's all it was. What you did was who you were. And so as long as it matched, that's what it was. I, I mean, for example, um, in Rome, here was things that, uh, I'm not saying these are good or bad. Uh, some of them, are, I think, are bad. But in their culture, they would set themselves apart by what they wore, right? What you wore would kind of signify where in the social class you were. And so different colors on your toga would actually determine what status, what class, and where you stood in the culture. And so you would constantly be trying to find the right colors to show your status. Certain shoes that you would wear showed your status. We still have this today, don't we? Right? It, it matters some people today. It's like, but my shoes, you know? Um, you scuffed my shoes, and what happened? You ruined my status. And, and it's so funny because there, it was the same thing. Different colored shoes or different types of sandals meant different statuses in different classes. In Rome, another way that, that they, uh, another cultural acceptance was misogyny just wasn't accepted. It was actually celebrated. It was celebrated. Men were the ones who held all the power. They were the ones who could read, who could write. They were the ones who got educated to study. It was socially acceptable for men to go to brothels. It was fine. It was, it was legal. Prostitution was legal in Rome, and it wasn't a really big deal, except for the fact that the men got celebrated when they went, and the women were demeaned and shamed for what they did. You see, a man held all the power in this, and even in their home, after a woman would give birth, they would lay their baby at the foot of the man to say, what's your choice? Do we keep this baby or not? And if the father held up the baby and wanted to keep it, they would keep it. If not, he would put it in the street and lay it down, and they'd walk away. That's the way it was. Men held the power, to which I'm grateful for Christians who came and tried to rescue these children laid outside. You see, in Rome... Men ruled. That was culturally acceptable, and it flowed throughout the land. In Rome, actually, religion was part of everyday life. We always kind of hate on Rome for their persecution of Christians, but the truth is they celebrated all types of religion. They were one of the most religious cultures ever, and they found that um, in family homes, they actually wanted you to have shrines and idols so that you could do your prayers, your worship to your God in your home, and then go out and celebrate at the temples. They were everywhere. They wanted you to be religious, to gain the favor of as many gods as they could. And they wanted everyone to join in. Whatever's good for you is good for you, except actually for the Jewish people, which included those who believed Jesus was the Messiah because they believed in one God, and that meant really that's pretty exclusive, just one, to a culture that believes in many. And so there was a tension there. Can you see how that would be a tension? These are just simple patterns of, of Rome. These were just part of life, part of their culture. And they spread around from Rome to the entire known world, and everyone conformed. Conformity According to psychology today, I love this definition, it's the tendency for an individual to align their attitudes, their beliefs, their behaviors with those of the people around them. The tendency for an individual to align their attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors with those people around them. This was just expected in that culture. And Paul writes to this church and he says to them, do not conform. He says, do not conform. He's saying for a second, would you just hold up? I know what you see is going on around you. I know what you think is normal, but you need to put a pause on life for a second. Take a step back and and just ask, are all of these things patterns that God would want in my life? Are these norms to the culture, should they be part of the life that I live? Remember, your body is God's body, right? So You better be mindful about how you live in it. For the church, I'm pretty sure that Paul in this moment is hoping that they would remember the words of Jesus about not worrying what they wore all the time. And if they had enough, because God would take care of them. 
that he cared about them. I'm sure he was hoping that how this church would think about Jesus and who he surrounded himself with. He surrounded himself with Jews and Gentiles. He surrounded himself not just with men, but he elevated women to a place of equality with men and welcomed children in and said, no, 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 you let them come this way. The kingdom of heaven belongs to people who think like these kids. He celebrated children. He celebrated women. And he, he actually lowered the bar for men to say, you're not nearly as grand as you think you are. You're just as equal as everybody else in God's eyes. He shows no favorites. This would have looked different to their culture. I'm sure that in the rhythm and the life of this church, they would have remembered the words of Jesus where he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, that they can have all their shrines, but that is not going to save them. I am it, there is only one way. Paul knew the pressure that was on each person to conform to the social norms around them, to align their attitudes, their beliefs, and their behaviors with Rome. And as followers of Jesus, we still feel that pressure in 2022, don't we? I I have no desire to stand up here and tell you everything that sucks and that's wrong with the world today and what's wrong with the U.S. I'm I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna tell you why you should avoid this or avoid that. I do not get to dictate what music you listen to, movies you watch, how you're supposed to behave, or how you're supposed to vote. I don't get to do that. Because then, you're just conforming to Christianity. This isn't what Paul wants for the church. It's it's not what I want for our church. What Paul wants for his church is for them to be transformed. He wants for them to be transformed, not conformed, but transformed. And this is the other word that he uses. Instead of conforming to the patterns of the world, he wants them to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. And this word transformed in the Greek is actually, it means to become or to be changed. This is where we get the English word uh, metamorphosis from. That's, it, this is the root of this word. And uh, if you would, for a second, just think about like first grade science when you grew butterflies in the classroom. You remember the metamorphosis that they go through? Um, you know, remember how it looked like nothing and all of a sudden you get this weird little bug that's crawling around eating everything and you're like, that's not a butterfly. Like, that's a bug. That's not what this is. And and all of a sudden, you come in one day, and this bug has now put itself in like a bug hammock that you can't get to, and you're like, it's just hanging there. This is stupid. I wanted a butterfly, not a a bug hammock. And I know that there's a word for that, but I'm in first grade science mode, so leave me alone, okay? And uh, this is how I see the world sometimes. It's a bug hammock. And so it, it just doesn't make sense. This is pointless. We wanted a butterfly. And then you come in that one day and you know that day the hammock breaks open and you see those wings stretched out flapping and there's this beautiful butterfly and we all sit in the place and wonder, how did this bug transform into a butterfly? This is the process of metamorphosis. And this, this right here that you're seeing, this is the picture that we need to be thinking of when we think about being transformed. And and Paul's desire for this church is for them to be changed people, actually changed people by the renewing of their mind. While conforming is about changing outward behavior, transformation is about changing the way that we think. It's about refreshing and renewing our minds. And Paul does not want this church to check their brains at the door and just behave like good little Christians should behave. Believe what good little Christians should believe. If they're going to resist, realistically, the pressure to conform to the world around them, they better start with renewing their minds and getting educated. They better start with engaging their brains. If they're going to have to take a step back in this moment from the circus that is the Roman culture and say, whoa, 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 how do I look at what's actually happening around me and not just say, yeah, sure, I'm in, and say, wait a second, is this what God has for me and for my body? Is this what God has for me and my choices? Is this what Jesus would do? Are the patterns that are normal in Rome normal in the kingdom of heaven? I'm sure that was tough. 
And I don't think it's any easier for us if you have chosen to follow Jesus today because we live in a fluid culture that is changing its values and its morals at an unreal pace. Not only that, we are told constantly by our culture that we need to be satisfied in life. And so we're always pushing to be satisfied. In the 1970s, the average American saw around 500 advertisements a day that told them what they needed. 500. And that seems like a lot. But by 2007, that number of advertisements was up to about 5,000. Today, depending on how often you're online or what your commute looks like, you could see and hear up to 10,000 advertisements a day. Do you know that? 10,000 times a day being told what you need and what will satisfy you and what you need to do to conform to be satisfied to the world that we live in. They tell us what our marriages should look like, what we should be spending and how much on cars and on clothes, what technology we need to make sure that we're not missing out on anything. They remind us of what everyone else around us has that's now considered normal and selling us the feeling that we will be left out if we don't conform to the patterns of this world. I worry, honestly, I worry that as followers of Jesus, as Christians, too many of us spend more time staring at the patterns of this world on our phones, on our TVs, that we can't even see that we are conforming because it's just normal now. without even knowing it. We've picked up the rhythm of the world. We're right in step with everyone else. And we sit and clap for everyone. But we do it from a Sunday morning seat. We look no different. We have no step. We smile while everyone's marching like good little citizens. You know, this wasn't always the way for many of us, and I know that. We we didn't just start following Jesus and do this. When we started following Jesus, it was really easy to keep in step with him, right? It was easy to follow him. And I can hear the voice of Mr. Keating in the courtyard right now when he says, if you notice, everyone started out with their own strides, their own pace, Now, those of you, I see that look in your eyes like, I would have walked differently. Well, then ask yourselves why you are clapping. Now, we all have a great need for acceptance, but you must trust that your beliefs are unique, your own, and even though others may think them odd or unpopular. Paul begs this church. He begs them and begs us to let our minds be changed, to be transformed like a butterfly, literally rewired from the patterns of this world that we live in. And for this to happen, we are gonna have to fight the patterns of this world with the word of God. We cannot think that we'll get hit with 10,000 advertisements a day and a Sunday morning, Jimmy talking about 80s with a mustache is gonna be enough to get you through the week. We all know that many of us will leave this cafeteria and already struggle before we leave that hallway and see our values going beyond mission. Yeah, what's that mean? And off we go. We are bombarded so quickly. For this to happen, we're going to have to intentionally create rhythms of spending time alone with God and with other followers of Jesus into our life. You cannot run from this. You can't think, oh, I'll be fine walking on my own. You won't. You'll catch a stride with somebody. You will. Actually, this is what Jesus did himself. He had his own pattern, didn't he? And he took his disciples and he says, I'm choosing you. And they all started to follow him. And he took a walk and they walked with him. And you know what he did? He made a regular habit of spending time alone with God and his disciples saw it. So later on, they do that. He spent a regular time studying the words of God. His father, he knew this and he learned it. And and so his disciples learned it and knew it. His disciples actually, though, walked with a different pace because they always seemed to be wanting to rush him. They didn't understand he was never in a hurry. They had a habit, and Jesus had a habit of living in obscurity. Do you know how many times he said to someone he healed, now don't go tell anybody, please. He cares for that person individually, not if he could post it somewhere so everybody could see it. But his disciples always wanted, and his families always wanted a bigger crowd. 
At one point, Jesus says something that is so radical, that is um, unbelievably offensive in comparison to the patterns of the world. And in John chapter six, his best friend John writes in his biography, in verse 60, he says, many of the disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And down in verse 66, he says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and he asked, are you going to leave? His 12 are still standing there. And what does Jesus do? He does what a good teacher does. He asks them a question. He wants them to think about what they're doing. Will they stay? Will they go? They are being formed in this moment. In this moment, they have a choice. Will they conform to the patterns of the world? Or will they be transformed more into the image of Christ? In verse 68, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter basically says, well, I got nothing else. Your rhythm is the only rhythm for me. I know what the other rhythm is like, and, and I, I can't walk that anymore. It's exhausting, but your rhythm, I will do this. And even when it's hard, he recognizes that what Jesus offers, his rhythms, his patterns, his way of life and thinking is eternal and nothing like what the world offers. So he'll just keep having to trust his teacher and have to keep on taking his next step. These guys right here would proceed to stride with Jesus even after his death and after his resurrection. They would trip all over the places they walked. The best part about being in stride with people is if you ever see someone get off and they start clipping feet and falling all over, this is what it's like to follow Jesus sometimes. But they would always help each other up. They would always remind each other about the rhythms and the teachings of God. We are all walking in step. We are. The question still remains. Am I in step with Jesus or the world? Am I in step with Jesus or the world? Who are the biggest voices in your life? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes to this church and he tells them, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts. The way that I've memorized it is bad company corrupts. Um, good character or bad company ruins good morals. Who and what do you surround yourself with because it matters? And parents, let me just steal your attention really quick. Kids, you could check out for a second because I know your parents are always bugging you about who you hang out with, right? And what you have to do and do all the right things. Um, parents, I know that you want this for your kids, that they would be around Good company, not bad company, because you know that it's hard. You want them to be in the right places, not the wrong places. And I know that you're, you're waiting right now to talk to them about this afterwards, and you're ready to be like, did you hear, did you hear, did you hear what he said? And um, the truth is, we have to remember, just like in the beginning, that this starts with us. This starts with us. The bottom line is there, statistically, it comes out, and it is, it's absurd you as a parent are the biggest influence on your kid. It's not their pastor, it's not their youth pastor, it's not their teacher, it's not even their friend. The patterns and the rhythms that you have as a parent influence your kids more than anything else in the world. They watch what you are doing. What rhythms, seriously, what rhythms are you setting in your personal life and in your home? Do you bug them about going to a small group and trying to have good, godly friends? Do you go? Are you plugged in with fellow, fellow followers of Jesus? Do you model this in a way that they'd say, it seems like it benefits your life. I should step in line with that. Do you want them to read God's word regularly, knowing that this is where true life is found? Do you? Do they see it? Do you want them to guard and pay attention to the media that they consume? Do you? I'm, I'm just saying, 
we're all in step with someone. We're either conforming to the patterns of this world or being transformed to the image of Christ. And parents, you lead your home. Don't give that up and don't let your kids determine what their pattern should be. You determine the pattern for your home. Live it out. I'm not saying your kids will fall in step. It doesn't happen in my house that easily. It's a battle to keep my steps. But I have hope that the steps that I take, my kids will follow in the end. Whether they do right now or not is not my problem. But I will encourage and bless and and desire them to do that. But I'm not mandating them to be good little Christians. I want their hearts and their minds to be transformed into the image of Christ, not just what daddy wants. Are you truly training your kids in the way that they should go or the way that you want them to be? You see, it starts with us. And I want to encourage you, if you're sitting here going, I don't know what to do with that, Wednesday night, come out and make the excuse of it's free Mr. Softy. Get there to be with people. Show them that it's an intentional move to be in community, to study the word, to have fun, to laugh together. If you don't show them, someone else is going to show them what community looks like. And unfortunately, you just can't sit like Mr. Dalton and sit back and say, well, I'm choosing not to walk. We're all taking steps, aren't we? Every one of us. But if we stop long enough to ask the question, am I in step with Jesus or the world? You know, back at Welton Academy and Dead Poets Society, the headmaster, he actually meets with Mr. Keating in the end, um, or midway through the movie. He reprimands him, actually, for this courtyard scene. He gets on his case, because he used to be the English teacher. He hates it, and he directly tells him, he's like, this is his quote. He says, stop teaching the kids to question authority. Stop teaching them. What, what he wants is for everyone to conform to the prescribed behavior of that school. This sounds an awful lot like the world that we live in. Jesus, however, what he does is he calls us to step back and to question, is this the right thing for me to be doing? Is this the right thing? You are being formed. Are you being conformed to the patterns of this world or transformed into the image of Christ? And he ends the clip with Robert Frost said, two roads diverged in the wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Which road are you on? Which road have you taken? Would you stand and pray with me as we prepare to take communion today? Jesus, I confess to you just simply the struggle it is to stay on that narrow road that you call me to and not get distracted by the patterns of this world. Would you, Holy Spirit, would you, Jesus, forgive me for where I have failed you? Where I've listened to voices who say this is normal and that's cool, just run with it, and and I've been in step or I've clapped from the sidelines thinking, well, I'm not doing it, but I sure have engaged and not said that that's not it. That's not the way of Jesus, so forgive me, Father, for why I have lacked to love people like you have commanded me to. Even as a church, Father, would you forgive us for, for the times that we may have isolated people that we have forgotten about people, the times that, that, that we have stepped with the world thinking that our privilege, our preference, our desires are what matter most when we have lost the view of loving others around us, to care, to be compassionate, to listen, to celebrate. Father, forgive us for our pride and our arrogance of thinking we know the right steps. Forgive us. I want to give you just a minute or so. And if there's something that the Holy Spirit's bringing to your heart or mind that you feel like you need to confess in this moment to God where you may have been out of step with him, if you choose to follow him, would you just take that time to confess?
Jesus, as we come together to celebrate communion. We have bread and, and a cup of juice that you call us to, to, to eat and celebrate together your death and your resurrection every single time that we gather, that there is this, this moment of holiness that happens around a simple practice that brings us back to the truth that you told your disciples the road to follow me is narrow and not everybody's gonna take it, but those who do, oh, there's life abundantly here and forgiveness for every time you trip. And that, that forgiveness is gonna come through my body that's gonna be broken for you and my blood that's spilled out for you and it didn't make sense to anyone and that's why everyone left you in John 6. They left you because you said, eat my flesh, drink my blood, that you want us to be part with you. And people left, so Holy Spirit, I ask that you would allow us to leave here with great joy, that we would leave here in step with Jesus, and when we are out of step, we ask for conviction heavy on our lives so that we would get back in step to call each other into step. In Jesus' name, amen. At the Passover Seder, he took the bread and he said to his disciples, this is my body that's been broken for you and it offended so many people weeks ago and now or months, years ago and then it came to be everything that we remember, would you eat with me? And if you miss communion, I apologize. Uh, you just raise your hand and, and Bill's coming around with it. Jesus, thank you for your body broken for us, amen? And then he took the cup, and the cup at the end of Passover, after a couple cups of wine, this last cup is the cup of redemption. This is the cup of celebration. This is the cup that says, you have been redeemed. And he holds up the cup of redemption. He says, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Anything that you have confessed, can I tell you the great news and the good news of Jesus? You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Would you turn to the person next to you, whomever it is, and just tell them, you are forgiven. No, no, seriously, look them in the eyes like you mean it. Tell them, you are forgiven. This is the good news of Jesus, amen? Let's celebrate the blood of Christ in our life together. Today, may you go with this benediction. Would you truly be Christians? Not in a cultural, U.S. or evangelical way, but would you be little Christ's? who look like him, live like him, love like him, think like him, practice like him, take steps to honor the body that you have and those around you. In every situation that you find yourself in, would you go and love like Jesus this week? Amen. We'll see you next week as we uh, tackle the Karate Kid. Amen.